Uh, Gopal said to hit it first. I generally wait till I get done talking, but I, I hit it. So I will record it. And then I will send out the recording along with the deck. M said that she's going to send the deck to me and I'll, I'll send that out too. Probably, I probably won't get to it till this, till this weekend. Uh, I'm also going to put it live on Zoom uh, right now. And uh, I don't know if anyone watches it on Zoom, but I'm doing it because it's just fun to do. So, uh, so I'm going to be doing that as well. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to our uh, guest, M. Campbell Pretty. It's all yours. Thank you, Jay. Uh, greetings from the future, folks. Uh, it is a... She got muted by the host. I, yeah, that's my muted fault. Me. That's my fault. I'm so <laughs> sorry. I have to start all over. Sorry. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> this is a first. <laughs> um, hi, folks. Uh, greetings from uh, Melbourne, Australia, where it is Friday morning. Um, and it is sunny and beautiful. Um, hope uh, life in the in the US is treating you okay. Um, really glad to be able to, to be here with you guys today. Uh, this is a, a session I did almost exactly a year ago in Seattle, uh, and Ron was there and thought it was kind of fun and said, would you do it in the valley sometime? And I said, sure, and he held me to that. So, um, although I didn't get a flight to San Francisco out of it, so meh, uh, maybe, maybe next time. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this little session is about tribal unity, which is what I call a culture-based approach to the scaled agile framework. Uh, I do have the chat window open. So in theory, if you ask me questions through chat as we roll along, I will see them and answer them. Um, so folks, just to help me know my audience, um, can you use your Zoom window to give me a, a, a thumbs up or a, or a yes in the participants window or something like that, uh, if you are familiar with SAFE. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so, okay. So I think most people are. I'm going to work. Uh, thank you for the yeses in the in the chat. Um, I'm going to go with it feels like most people do. If I talk about something you don't know, just ask, right? Not, no problems whatsoever. Happy to explain. But I'll err on the side of most people are familiar enough with SAFE that I don't need to explain every, every single nuance as we, as we move through. But very happy to take questions. So my, um, my journey to tribal unity uh, it starts in a, in a different time travel. Now I'm going to take you back almost 10 years. I was a general manager. I was working at a large telecommunications company in Australia, probably the, um, the equivalent of AT&T or something like that in the, in the US. Uh, I was working on the business side. Uh, I'm, I'm a business person. I, I didn't grow up in, in technology. And I was the business sponsor of a program of work that uh, related to an enterprise data warehouse. And pretty much my, I call my life feeding, feeding the money fire. The way this worked was uh, as a business sponsor, I would go to the CFO and I would say, can you please give me some money for this program of work? And he would give me some money and then I would give the money to the technology team and the technology team would light a match and set it on fire and then come back and ask me for more money. Then I would go back to the CFO and this was pretty much rinse and repeat for um, about five years, um, which was particularly awesome. To um, add insult to injury, the, the environment uh, with this particular delivery team was referred to as toxic. This isn't my term. This is how people 
spoke about the place. So people would, you know, someone would come on site to do something and, and their commentary around the environment that they experienced would be this place is toxic. In the strangest restructure of all time, somebody in their wisdom decides that the solution to the non-delivering technology organisation is to hand it over to the business sponsor to lead. I didn't think it was a good idea at the time. I'm still not convinced it's a particularly good idea. Um, I told them that they really didn't care. Uh, they were kind of funny. Whatever you need, Em, we'll give you anything you need to support you in this journey. Then those people left me in the job, disappeared, never saw them again. Anyway, we went on a journey and over a journey of two years, this is the same toxic organisation. <laughs> Take 395. <laughs> that, um, that was truly a group of software de developers doing the Macarena. Um, you know, clearly a sign of a toxic culture or maybe one that had changed over a number of years. Uh, interesting, interesting day for me. Uh, not, not my idea at all. There was a, a corporate competition that uh, suggested that people should show their colours, which meant dress in the, in the new corporate colours and um, take photos of themselves living the, the corporate values. And a couple of those were things like better together and, and courage. So these guys dressed up in the, in the corporate colors and decided their better together and courage play would be to record themselves um, doing the Macarena. The, uh, the goal was to win a, uh, enough money to buy a PlayStation for the, or an Xbox or something for the office. Would you believe these guys didn't win? How sad is that? Anyway, so how, how did we get there? What, what changed? The, um, after that particular day, I was chatting with my, with my team and we were reflecting on the, the nature of the environment. And one of the guys said to me, you know, we're, we're like a tribe, right? We're, we're this kind of close knit tribe. And that got me interested in, in what does it mean to be a tribe? And for, uh, I started reading because that's kind of the geek I am. And I came across tribal leadership, which is uh, David Logan's book. And David Logan says, birds flock, fish school, people tribe. So his premise is that is just what we do. And he defines a tribe as, you know, around that 150 people that make up a community. Uh, also happens to be the magic number uh, of the Agile release train in, in SAFE. Um, and it's a number that reoccurs throughout history. So you see it in, um, in the military, you see it in a lot of org structures. Essentially, as humans, we're pretty happy to hang in a, in a social group of around 150 people. And if those groups get up bigger than 150 people, they subdivide. Um, so just part of our nature. So if we're going to form tribes naturally, what does it matter? Um, Logan's research, and he did a um, fairly significant research piece, it was 24,000 um, folks were, were interviewed across a number of companies. And what he found was what makes some tribes more effective than others is their culture. And Logan's research uh, studied how people talk the language that they use inside organisations and said that there was a correlation between the language people use and the nature of the, of the culture. So he found five distinct uh, views of, of cultures of American based study. Uh, the, the first stage is, is life sucks, um, not a particularly prevalent culture. Um, something about, so it was about 2% of the organisation, um, so the organisation, 2% of the, the population. Um, this is the culture that is often 
um, correlated with uh, gangs and prisons, right? So not particularly awesome, awesome cultures. And, and people there say life sucks. Uh, stage two makes up uh, about 25% of the uh, population. This is a, uh, David Logan says, this is the, um, the part of, this is the culture you see at the DMV, which um, is very American construct and, and a little bit different here. I've taken American friends to our version of the DMV and it's nowhere near as bad, but maybe social service would be a, a more universal term. Stage uh, three, I'm great, is the most prevalent culture we see in, in organisations. Um, this is the, it's about 49% um, of the organisation. Uh, the idea is I'm great and you're not. Uh, this is the culture that we see in um, a lot of professions, um, lawyers, doctors, etc. cetera. Um, so it's very much about the individual. Stage four is we're great, and you're not. So this is around 22, 23% of the, the population. Um, so this is the, the culture of winning sports teams, right? Um, we're awesome, our competitors are less awesome. Stage five is um, also not particularly prevalent. It's only about 2% of the, the population. Life is great. Uh, and this is the culture you see inside organisations that are doing life-changing work. Um, so uh, organisations that are, you know, hospitals and uh, fighting battles with cancer research and things like that. And stage five is actually not a steady state. Organisations bump in and out of it. So really, where do you want to get to? You want an organisation in stage four that has the ability to, to bump to stage five. So we're looking for these, these we're great uh, cultures because, of course, um, we want our tribes and our trains, in the case of SAFE, to be effective. So making the link back to, to SAFE, because SAFE doesn't embrace culture, SAFE embraces results. So why are we interested in culture if, our, um, if we're interested in results? Did my sound just die? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? It's a little choppy right now, so I think it's everybody. Yeah, it's probably Zoom. Zoom. Yep. Maybe having infrastructure problems or something. Okay, so, stop interference. So we can hear you. Hopefully. Yep. Very good. Awesome. Um, oh my goodness, sorry, I don't know what my um, computer is doing. You guys say you can hear me, so I guess that's good. Okay, very good, uh, shall return, it was showing up error messages at, at this end. Uh, thanks for your patience, guys. Uh, so, um, the, uh, so, safe and braces results, we know that the effectiveness of tribes is impacted by culture, so for me, these things are, are hard tied. And I really enjoy this quote from Tony Shea, founder and CEO of Zappos. Businesses often forget about culture and that ultimately they suffer for it because you can't deliver good service from unhappy employees. So we know what we want, right? We want, we want a great culture. We have a feeling for what that looks like. How are we going to get there? Um, another book on tribes comes from Seth Godin. A tribe is a group of people connected to one another, connected to a leader, leader and connected to an idea. I kind of like this. So let's start with how do we connect people to one another? So for me, the basis of an awesome tribe is an awesome agile team or many, hopefully, awesome agile teams want to understand that an agile team, um, and particularly an awesome team, is going to be one that has a shared mission. So a team is not a random group of people who happen to work together. A team is a group of people with a shared mission. The size of this team is also important. The Scrum Guide and the Safe Guidance talks to team sizes of 5 to 11. 
So anything from five people with 10 lines of communication through to 11 people with 55 lines of communication. For me, I prefer seven plus or minus two. So we're maxing out here at 36 lines of communication. There's a reality that large teams can't deliver because large teams can't communicate. Um, I actually had this experience many years ago. Uh, somebody had misinterpreted pairing as a need to have two of everything. I call it the Noah's Ark approach to Agile. Uh, so they'd have two of every role and a team of 24 people. And we were um, not delivering very well, no great surprises there. And somebody suggested to me that if we halved the size of the team, we could save some money and we would improve our delivery. So we did. And the next sprint, the team delivered the same amount of you know, points, same throughput as they had with the 24 people. The sprint after, their throughput went up. Large teams can't deliver because they can't communicate. So we want small, mission-capable teams, seven plus or minus two. Now, some of you are going, mm, yeah, sure, awesome theory, M, love your textbook. Um, you know, how do I get all the skills necessary? How do I get a mission-capable team and keep it to that seven plus or minus two? Well, as the lean folks say, start where you are. You do the best you can um, with what you've got. You start to build, build up people's cross-functionality. And over time, you get to more and more mission-capable teams and less and less component-based teams. When it comes to how we form teams, I'm a big fan of Sandy Mamoli's self-selecting approach, also known as squadification. Sandy Mamoli um, is an Austrian-born Kiwi. Uh, her book is Creating Great Teams. Here's, here's my theory. Self-selecting teams is about letting people choose for themselves what team they're a part of. So an organisation says, I want to I wanna be different. And the thing I'm, I'm going to do to change my organisation is this agile thing. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is tell you what your new team is. It doesn't really feel like anything different probably to what went on in the past. So... What I suggest is, if you want to send a message to the organisation that things are different, then what you would do is let people choose for themselves what team they're going to be a part of. So it's a facilitated process of letting people self-organise into small cross-functional teams based on the belief that people are at their happiest and most productive if they can choose what they work on and who they work with. So that's kind of awesome. Um, it's, it's funny, I get to do this with probably about 50% of organisations I work with. The number one reason um, or fear that leaders have about letting people choose their team for themselves is what if people choose to work with their friends? Can you imagine that? Wouldn't it be a horrible world if people chose to work with their friends and did work with their friends? I'm like, oh my goodness, we can't let that happen. Um, <laughs> Of course, people are going to choose to work with people they like. Um, and that's going to make them happier and that's going to make them more productive. Um, it is important to note this is a facilitated process, so it's not a free-for-all. So we want those, um, those teams to work in manners that should be familiar to, to everybody. Visualise the work, communicate daily, inspect and adapt on cadence. And if these teams happen to be in the software domain, Extreme, you've got to do some extreme programming. Um, it's, the, it's one of those interesting things around how Agile is introduced into a lot of organisations. I know my first experiences were, with Agile were very process-centric. I've got to tell you, process-based Agile without good technical practice is a very expensive proposition. Um, so you're going to want some good extreme programming and software craftsmanship taking place in there as well. So from an agile team to an awesome team of teams. J. Richard Hackman was a Harvard professor um, and the author of a number of books. He um, estimated that 30% of team effectiveness depends on the quality of the team's launch 
for the life of the team. So how we kick a team off is always going to impact how that team performs. So if I want to kick off a team of teams, um, I'm a big fan of the, the quick start uh, approach. So this is something uh, probably well known to, to most SAFE folks. Uh, the idea is, and the, and the way they do it in, in SAFE is a little bit different to this. Uh, they do two days, the SAFE version is two days SAFE for teams training for everybody on the train, followed by the first two day PI planning event and finishing up with a, a day of whatever other stuff needs to be done. Uh, what I like to do is take that spare day and make it day number one. Um, train building, uh, I tend to call it team day. So team day uh, might be a, a half day of self-selection, but then it's gonna be a bunch of activities designed to help create that foundation of that awesome team of teams. So creating that kickoff that's gonna enable effectiveness. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the things that we like to do. Our focus is on creating shared identity and shared experiences. So starting with identity, the first thing we do when we create a new team of teams is create and share personal maps. So these personal maps, um, this concept I got from Jürgen Apello, uh, the idea is you just you know, hand everyone out a piece of paper and some pens and you say, draw a mind map. Uh, we use this example, we tell people to share as much or as little as they like um, based on how comfortable they are. And then we do some speed dating where people hand their maps over to someone they don't know. The person points to the map and asks some questions and people start to get to know each other. And it looks a little bit like this. <laughs> I always find phenomenal about that is the amount of noise it generates when everybody starts talking to everybody else. So this is step one in what I call creating the social fabric of your tribe or train. So <laughs> sorry, next thing we want to do is um, get that get a name for our train or our tribe. Um, maybe you want to use a bit of a, an e poll. Uh, every time I look at this photo, I realize that right in the center there, it says drugs. So I now need to explain to you that this particular Agile Release train um, was working on software for, for pharmacies. Um, and that software actually dispenses medications. Uh, hence, drugs was one of the possible names for their train. Uh, they didn't go with drugs, you'll be, be pleased to know. Um, Got to tell you, I've launched more Marvel trains than I know what to do with. Um, lots of characters you can then name your teams after. Or my favourite is definitely got to be BART, the broadband agile release train, with of course all the characters named after the Simpsons. And then some, a dragon train with a bunch of dragon names. So with all the teams named and the and the train named and the theme in place, it's time to, to get into what does that mean for us. We have an exercise called Team Product Boxes. So it comes from Luke Homan's innovation game where a ideation approach for a new product would be to create the box that the product comes in. So you create the box, you put the ingredients on it, you put all the cool marketing slogans on it, and then the team stands up in front of all the other teams and presents that that box. Um, awesome for team of team building, uh, a little bit of um, vulnerability from one team to another starts to build some trust. Um, and I, I do so enjoy this year, this is the leadership team with their Puff the Magic Dragon uh, box being shared with the, with the train. Final part of team identity is tribe t-shirts or train t-shirts. Um, apparently if we, um, a sign that you um, are proud of where you work, you like where you work, you feel a sense of belonging is whether you're prepared to wear your team t-shirt in public. So, you know, identity in, in the corporate world is the same as identity anywhere else. So like football clubs, we like colors, we like mascots, uh, we like uniforms. These are things that as humans uh, appeal to us.
So shared identity to shared experiences. So again, focusing on kicking off our team of agile teams and following along with our um, quick start approach, we are training everybody all in and all at once. So all of our team of teams is going through two days of training on what their new world is going to look like. And whether you're using safe or not, this is such a valuable concept because you have everybody hearing the same instructions from the same instructors at the same time. So you're able to get an alignment piece as well as creating a shared experience for everybody on the tribe. And you can even do this distributed. So if we were to have a train split across, say, Sydney, Australia, and Pune, India, uh, we would actually be running those events in parallel and sending information backwards and forwards between those teams. And of course, now in our COVID world, we're um, running these events uh, fully, everybody online at the same time, uh, running online on running online training, adjusting the time zones or the timing of the class so that people can attend in a, in a reasonable, uh, normal time of, time of day. Um, and of course, our PI planning event creates shared experiences and again, even works remotely. So Brisbane in the fore foreground and you can sort of see at the back there, the, uh, the Hong Kong component of this particular Agile release train. Now, if it's great to bring everyone together for PI planning when we kick everything off, wouldn't it be great to bring people together more frequently? So that Macarena video you saw at the start of this session came from a Unity Hour event. This is um, traditionally the first hour of every sprint, bringing together all the teams on the train or the tribe to hang out, eat some food, cheesecake grab, uh, shout outs, share with their, thank each other for things that they have done uh, to support each other over the last sprint, run learning exercises and make uh, various announcements. So we had um, executives come and chat to the train around how the work the train was doing for them um, fed into the broader business objectives. We play agile games, getting grown men to uh, create paper planes and try to fly them is always great fun. Um, some collaboration exercises, a little bit of Pictionary where the team of um, teams would share with each other what their sprints had been like using uh, Pictionary. A uh, little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, fundraising fun. Uh, so, I don't know if this is a global phenomenon, but we have something called Movember, where during November, uh, guys grow mows and raise money for charity. Uh, we can then dot vote on the best mo, um, and we can also present Miss Movember to the person who grows the smallest mo. Uh, uh, comment from Ron. Apple little fun, you couldn't create a project plan until after you named the project and passed out the t-shirts. <laughs> That's awesome, Ron. <laughs> um, also, uh, potluck, sharing some food, great way to spend a, a unity hour. Um, Linda Rising says in her, uh, her book, Fearless Change, that people, humans think that anyone they eat with is friend, not foe. So if you're trying to build community, getting people to eat together is actually a really great way to get people to, to bond. Um, for this particular group, a uh, number of Indians are among them who thought it was really great fun to make very hot curries. And then of course, the, um, the white boys would be uh, very, um, very quick to tell us all how much they could stand hot curry and be standing there sweating through lunch as um, they tried the very many, very hot curries. So once every 12 weeks of PI planning, once every two weeks for unity hour, can we do it again? Sure, daily, daily cocktail hour. Um, you may be disappointed to learn that this is not the same as the cocktail hour some of you are now having. Uh, this is generally nine o'clock in the morning and does not involve any cocktails. Um, I hear that is upsetting to, to some folks. Th thank you, Seth. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Um, this is a cascading set of stand-ups, uh, usually first thing in the morning. The first one here is, um, is the leadership team coming to be together, um, aligning for the day ahead, followed by the t each of the teams doing their regular stand-ups, uh, followed by a um, what SAFE would call an art sync. Uh, representation from all teams, scrum masters, product owners, tech leads, um, RTEs, product managers, and anyone interested in the train. I always call this a heartbeat of the Agile release train. So this is 15 minutes sync every single day. And this means we are getting connectivity between the across the train every single day. And in this model, we uh, also have people who have their stand-ups after the big sync because their day's priorities is actually driven by what's going on across the broader group. So continuing on that theme of cross-pollination across the teams, uh, communities of practice are another cool tool. SAFE doesn't use this model, but I quite like it. Uh, you may recognise an image here taken from uh, the Spotify paper by Henrik Nieberg and Anders Ivarsson written in uh, 2012, Scaling Agile at, at Spotify. And they talk about the concept of a chapter, where a chapter is a group of people with the same specialisation. And the chapter lead is the line manager of those specialists. So as we're moving into these mission capable teams, we've created a bunch of cross-functional teams, uh, which means that we have spread our specializations across the tribe and across the train. Um, so the chapter model is a nice way to keep connectivity across the people who do the same type of work. And they have those chapters catch up once or twice a week, do things like peer review, share ideas, um, talk about their roles and just keep that connectivity going. Another thing to think about if you're trying to build a team of teams is how you celebrate. So you need to remember to celebrate as a tribe, not just a team. I think we're really quick to go, one team did something awesome so they get cake. Um, what about one team did something awesome and everybody gets cake? Uh, so we have here a guy named Smurf uh, with an epic cake. So an epic was completed and there was cake for everybody. Uh, another thing I've learned is if you have a group of 100 people, you can have birthday cake twice a week, every week of the year. Um, so if it's somebody's birthday, it's not just cake for the team, it's cake for all the teams. There is a lot of cake. Um, you can also have cake to celebrate a number of uh, sprints or iterations or PIs. Um, and in fact, when this particular group reached 50 sprints, they took the day off. A little bit of team foosball, a little bit of wee rock band. And when, coming to, when it comes to celebration, don't be too fussy. You can also celebrate International Talk Like a Pirate Day. Yes, it's a real thing. It's the 19th of September. Um, one of the most um, rewarding parts of, um, of Unity Hour and bringing people together is the idea of shout outs. Uh, so shout out, not sure if it's, a, if it's an Aussie term, uh, a shout out would be a, a thank you or a congratulations to someone. So we would have uh, team members, uh, we would have team members check, uh, talk to each other. Oh, sorry, it flicked, flicked up at me again that it had lost connectivity, but you guys seem to still be there. Um, so, sorry, shout outs. Uh, a person would uh, stand up in front of the team of teams and say, hey, thank you to, to Fred. Uh, that was really awesome how you helped me out with that really difficult problem last sprint. And, and then everyone gives a thunderous round of uh, applause. Um, so just awesome for, for team of team building. Uh, I've worked with a few trains and tribes where people will not get up and, and talk in front of others. Uh, and they used uh, Jürgen Apello's Kudo boss, box. Uh, so they would write um, thank yous or shout outs down on, on index cards, as you can see here. And then they would have the RTE read those out for the train at, at Unity Hour. All right, so we looked at connecting people to one another. 
The second part of this approach is connecting people to the leader, connection to a leader. So, <laughs> I blame the phone company, but we can still hear you. <laughs> Um, so connecting to a leader, best way for leaders to connect is to go to the Gemba, go to the real place where the work is done. Um, obviously a little bit different in our virtual world, but in our physical world, that means going and spending time walking the floors. Um, of course, looking at people write code, not so interesting maybe. Um, so what I, what I used to do is I would take a couple of hours, um, I think it was every Friday morning, so it would have been right now, um, and I would go and visit all the teams. We call it walk the walls. So remember, we have all those visualizations, uh, go and visit the teams, visit their walls, ask the teams what's going on, what's, um, what we are, tell us about, about how your sprint's going, tell us about the work. You will learn so much about how the work works in your organization just by hanging out with the teams in their workspaces. The, um, the trick to this is not to ask them what they are doing, but to ask them, how can I help? Because if you ask someone, what are you doing? It takes a very different um, tone to it than, thanks guys, how can I, how can I help? Um, it takes a little while for teams to get up the courage to ask for stuff, but once they ask, the big important thing is that you follow through on actioning their requests. So part of this connection to the leader is how does the leader serve the tribe? So you can get information around where the teams are stuck by visiting the teams in their spaces, uh, but we also have a ritual we like called bubble up. This um, this came from the idea that if the team of teams uh, in SAFE would get together at the end of, um, end of the PI and they'd do inspect and adapt, but that would be a very, um, almost a big batch, right? So we're talking eight, 10, 12 weeks now, let's talk about how we get better. How could we, how could we harvest some of the information coming out of the retrospectives uh, earlier than, than that? So what we asked teams to do is at the end of their, their sprint, do your regular retrospective. And some of the things that will come up in your retrospective, you will consider outside your control. And you'll focus your retrospective in on the things that you believe you can improve. But those things that are outside your control, what we'd like you to do is bring them, bring them to the leadership. So every team would send representatives to come and chat with the, the leadership of the, the Agile release train and the chapter leads um, and we would start to identify systemic issues that were impacting the train. And what was really nice about this is, again, that coming together, people would go, oh, yes, I know that issue. We solved it. And we're starting to, to just even break some of those, th those unsolvable outside our control issues down through the course of the PI. But there will be a bunch of stuff that needs some heavy lift. So what I have leadership teams do is have a continuous improvement Kanban um, where they have a bunch of um, things they are doing to make life better for the folks on the train. Or in this particular instance, a sporadic improvement Kanban uh, because this particular leadership team, which um, I was unfortunately a part of, was not very good at actually getting anything done. But having leadership teams work as agile teams and be transparent about that, so, so putting everything up on the walls in the office, uh, creates a world in which the, the train holds the leaders to account. Uh, nothing quite as embarrassing as your, te your teams asking you, you know, what's your velocity, when is your next showcase um, or sprint demo uh, to motivate you to actually do something. I think one of the keys to creating connections between the team of team and leaders is vulnerability. Uh, Brene Brown said, vulnerability is the last thing I want you to see in me and the first thing I look for in you. She calls it the vulnerability paradox. So you guys um, may or may not have noticed I did not appear in the, um, in the Macarena video. 
A um, couple of reasons for that. Uh, one being can't actually do the Macarena. Uh, the other being it's really important that somebody captured that video and, and what have you because they needed to enter a competition. So, um, you know, I was, I was helping with the capturing of the moment. So we get to the bubble up at the end of that sprint. And one of the teams decides to lodge a um, concern that is outside their control, which is M did not do the Macarena. A little bit awkward. So I've gone around to visit this team and um, I've explained to them that, you know, I don't know how to do the Macarena. And the guys on this team are particularly awesome. They happen to read my blog. And I happen to have been stupid enough to have already written a blog about how it was important for leaders to be vulnerable in front of their tribes. So they tell me we read this blog about how important it is for leaders to be vulnerable um, and how I you know, really wasn't leading by example at this point. So we did a deal. Um, given I couldn't do the Macarena, uh, I said I would do a, a bus stop. Um, which I think is a, a dance you guys don't actually have in, in the US, but you have a lot of similar things. Anyway, this is how it goes. doesn't get any better. Um, <laughs> so that was me and my leadership team. Thank you, Seth. <laughs> um, yeah, that was me and my, uh, my leadership team. Um, clearly, I was a lot shorter than I thought I was. Um, I'm greatly appreciated by, um, by all. All right. So final, final little part of our puzzle here, connecting to an idea. Um, this is probably the, the simplest simplest part of this equation, because it doesn't have to be grand. You have to have a vision, you have to have an idea, and you need to communicate it. You don't need to be JFK, putting a man on the moon. This is not necessary. For the folks that I started this journey with, we, we aspired, definitely aspired, to be world leaders in agile data warehousing. And while I don't believe we ever became world leaders in agile data warehousing, we did create a really awesome environment with that aspiration. The, um, my dream for these folks was a one team culture. Um, and that was what I asked of them and that is what we got from them. So how do we keep all this going? Well, metrics, of course, what else? Uh, I really enjoy using the employee net promoter score. So this is um, part of the net promoter system. Uh, employee net promoter score is, would, I, would you recommend working here? Would you recommend working on this agile release train to a friend or colleague? Um, what I like about this is it's really simple. So I can send out a survey monkey or a Google form. I can send it out once every PI, once every three months, and I can include everybody, um, including contractors, vendors, consultants, um, and I can get a result back within a week because it's only three questions. Would you recommend, why would you say that? Why did you say that? And um, any other comments? And the trick to this is ask the question, read the information, action any problem areas. Really simple, makes a huge difference. Do you know just the act of asking people how they feel about where they work will actually improve how people feel about where they work because it illustrates you care. So bottom line, what is this really all about? Creating an environment in which people feel safe to be themselves at work. That's it. That's, that's completely it. It's about creating the environment in which people are happy to be the interesting, fun characters that they are in the real world in the workplace. I um, remember the first time I told this story to a, to a group of um, Americans. They, uh, they told me that this was just, you know, obviously crazy Aussie stuff. I said, you know what's most interesting about this train? There were a lot of Aussies, but there were a lot of non-Aussies on this train as well. There were Brits, South Africans, Indians, um, you know, people from all over 
the world. There was nothing particularly Australian um, about this culture. In fact, as I'm looking at this photo, I can see a Frenchman and, a, um, and an American as well. So, uh, you know, little examples of people feeling safe to have fun. Um, I took a day out of the office for an offsite. The team put uh, the, 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 the mascot in charge, uh, who was a skeleton. Um, so that's the uh, skeleton in my office. Uh, they then uh, brought Ryan Gosling to stand up. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the guys bet the train that we couldn't raise $1,000 to shave for a cure. But if we did, we could wax his legs in the office. So we did. Um, another guy was very upset with some of the uh, floor restructures and wanted a corner office. So the rest of the team uh, made him a corner office out of streamers. These are just people having fun feeling comfortable about where they work. So, one last example for you folks. IR5869, feature 2034, we still haven't received that. Hi, Kajin! Hi, Kai! Bye! So, Milo, Gina and I were just discussing how we can be a little bit more innovative in how we communicate. So, I want to try something different at the feature wall. Have a think about it, and we'll discuss it a little bit more. Ah. IR5869, feature 2034. We're still waiting for sample mm, I'm, I'm not quite sure that's what I was referring to, Wayne, but have another go. Okay, so um, what we found out in today's stand up was there a few issues, defects, that we did a retrospective. Then we started working on it, and all of them. <laughs> That's how the disco's getting done. <laughs> Nailed it, Wayno. Nailed it. That's a good blog. I've got a blog. Megzy, got another blog. So when I left this group, they decided that they would um, make a short feature film to uh, celebrate me leaving, and that's a little uh, clip that, that, that uh, short feature film that they made. Um, anyway, so to quote Richard Sheridan, I don't, need, I, don't, I don't assume what worked for me is going to work for you, but I do want to, um, I do want to inspire you as you contemplate what an intentional culture of joy could look like in your world. Uh, so, so folks, thank you very much for, um, for, for listening. Um, very happy to, to chat for as long as you, as you like. Um, if you liked my story, you might like uh, my book, uh, which is Tribal Unity. Um, I also have a second book released uh, late last year, which is The Art of Avoiding a Trainwreck. And if you'd like to stay in touch, uh, Twitter, blog, email, LinkedIn, you name it. And um, as promised, I'll pass the, uh, the deck along to, um, to, for, for, to Jay for sharing. So you guys can apparently hear me, but I'm going to need to sort something out with my computer to be able to hear you, I think. Yeah, so apparently the phone company you work for is getting back at you. Oh. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, you know what it was? I had the headset on yesterday and it must be lying around here somewhere and it's picking up on Bluetooth. And what it must be doing is taking the sound. It was obviously uh -huh. allowing me still to talk to you guys, but I couldn't hear anything. So those videos for me played with no sound. Um, but I'm assuming that, that you guys got the sound. Oh, no, we got the sound. So, um, you. you were just bit video choppy. So that's going to look funny when yeah. I start recording out because you're going to be frozen like... <laughs> for like two minutes and then you'll talk and you go so <laughs> so so that you know just letting you know uh but thank you so much that was uh that was very exciting entertaining and informative uh so i love the fact that you know what we do for a living all of us you know to earn money and pay our bills and mortgage it's hard work, but if we don't have fun and, and interact with other human beings and, and learn from them and, and, and be connected, 
then we're missing the whole point of life, right? So I think I think so you bring that I bring you bring that to the table. So thank you so much for that. So now I would like to open up for. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any questions anyone has, go ahead and unmute. We're, we've got 20 people. I think we can handle it. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask the question or send it in the chat. Okay, so I've got I've got a question. So um, uh, here here in the U.S. at least, um, um, the 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 potlucks are not happening. <laughs> Uh, uh, there are there are a bunch of there are a bunch of of, of um, examples you used with food and and um, and uh, you know I cr I cr I'm craving donuts at this point but um, uh, and donut days and donut mornings and um, I'm craving donuts but what have you found for a substitute for those kinds of things in the last few months? Um, you know what, well, people are just using the infrastructure that they have in place. Um, so, you know, most of the folks I, I work with are doing safe, which means that when they got to a world where everyone had to work from home, uh, first thing we noticed is nobody skipped a beat, right? They, they ran their PI planning meetings on schedule, they just moved everything online. Um, they're running their daily art sync. They're doing all of these things and they're just doing it online because they they have the infrastructure to support it, whatever that infrastructure is, whether it's Zoom or, or Meet or, or um, whatever it is, Microsoft Teams or, or what have you. So, I mean, I hear st stories about, you know, a company sending pizzas to everybody, people having their breakfast together on Zoom. Um, you know, people are, are just, just making it work. They're just using the, the tools that we have available to us to, to keep doing what they've been doing. Hey, uh, M, this is Gopal. Awesome presentation, really <laughs> exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you share some experiences? You were talking about bringing the leadership into the fold and making it into a tribe. And there was one slide that you showed, which was like a leadership board with milestones or something. That was one thing. If you want to put it up, I just want to see it again. But I just want to, yeah, um, yeah. you know, if you can share some experiences where you had to turn around some tough leadership positions, you know, uh, entrenched leadership positions and what, what you did, maybe one or two examples. I uh, would love to hear that. Yeah, sure. Not, not the safe, not the safe. Uh, what's life you're looking? Yeah, I got that. <laughs> oh, okay, um, there you go. <laughs> or that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, <laughs> Probably if I'm on a, on a client site, I, I can be kind of demanding. Um, so I don't know that this is necessarily optional if you, if you get to the misfortune to work with me. Uh, you know, I, I, if, we were, if I was going to be you know, launching a, a train or, or whatever agile initiative, uh, I would have run those leaders through leading safe in the context of safe, but whatever, some sort of agile training or training what it was I was trying to get them to do. Um, this particular wall grew out of a book club. Um, initially, what we did uh, in, in the, the initial first story, first time I did this, uh, we, this is before there was safe training. Um, it was before there was a big picture. Um, there were just Dean's books. So when I went to do this, I said to my leadership team, you need to read this, this book. Um, and, and of course they didn't. Uh, and then I found out that they didn't. And I said to them, we need to, we need to pivot folks. Um, we, we really actually, I need you all to understand this. So what we're going to do is you're all going to get a copy of the book. And if you can't get the book, you're going to tell me I'm going to get the book for you. And then we're going to set aside an hour a week. And each week we're going to go through one chapter of this book. And the conversation is going to be what things make sense for us and we're going to do, what things don't make sense for us and we're not going to do, and what things do we think we want to do but maybe a little bit differently because of our context. And we started building a backlog. So the initial to-do list here came from reading as a team, 
um, and coming up with ideas as a team of the things that we needed to do to get from where we were to where we where we wanted to be. Um, the you know, part of it's about making the commitment to do that. So that was one hour, it was every week, everybody turns up, that meeting always happens. If one person can't make it, then you know, we, we, we move the meeting or we make something work because it had to be about creating a shared um, backlog of things to do and then focusing in on this. Um, we would run a, a session once a week where we would just chat about how we were moving these things forward. Uh, we tried not to have too many in play at any time. Um, because it's also about how do you work together as a team of leaders to support each other in getting these improvements made. So it wasn't about five people running off and doing their own thing. It was about how do we work together to create space for each other to, to do things. Um, so very much about having the, having the discipline. I think so much of this stuff just comes from having discipline. Um, it's one of the big takeaways I had um, a year or two ago, I got to go to uh, Japan on a lean study tour and we're chatting with the Toyota guys about you know, what, what makes Toyota different. And, and the view is it's, it's discipline, right? What's different from Toyota from a lot of other places in the world is, is quite simply discipline. Um, I don't know, guys, does that start to answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. I know you're pretty uh, ensconced in the safe world, but have you experienced this or done tribe building exercises with like Nexus or with less groups or any others who are trying to scale in different ways? Uh, my sense is all of this should apply. Um, and I do know of people who don't use safe and do use this. Uh, for me, <laughs> you know, safe, safe is, is the thing that I do. Um, it's a thing I've been doing, so um, I don't personally um, have any experience doing this outside the safe world because the people who hire me want to do safe. Um, but I do know that there are people who don't use safe who use this. In fact, even um, uh, uh, Joachim Sundan, one of the um, folks who became very well, so very much associated with the Spotify model, one of the original Spotify coaches out of um, Stockholm. I know he teaches a, um, I don't know, something like Agile at Scale is inspired by Spotify. And I know they use this book as a reference. So I, I know people use it. Thank you. <clears throat> this is it. Hi, this is Dale Ellis. I have a question. When you're working with teams uh, that have little to no experience with Agile, and I noticed that you conduct your team formation meeting before you go into the two-day educational uh, training sessions, uh, have you found that it's beneficial for them to have information about Agile or having some basic experience or knowledge before doing the team formation things, because I've seen that flipped where they do the training the first two days and then they do the team formation after that, because then people can self-select into teams with the people that they're familiar with and that they work with, but that can be tempered with the knowledge that they need to compose teams of people with a broad enough skill set that they can turn out a product so do you ever reverse that or do you find that it's helpful for them to have that knowledge before they form the teams? Yeah, um, so a few things. I'm just going to sort of wander my way through this. Um, I'll just start with the context on why we, why we do team formation and, and then um, the training. And it's so the training can be done as a team. So when we do that training, you sit in your team with your scrum master, with your product owner, who have already been trained in their roles. Um, so we use the training as part of our team formation, which means we, it, it, it's one of our you know, going in conditions. Um, in terms of how do we get to, to formation and, and how do people know enough? Uh, one of the things that continues to surprise me and probably shouldn't is how often people have been working together in the same building, in the same location for years and years and years, and actually just don't know each other. So um, when we're heading towards this sort of um, self-selection event, we're gonna need to do some things 
to get people meeting and greeting other folks. Um, I might use that um, speed dating exercise um, prior to a self-selection event. I've done that before. Um, we generally, certainly in a safe context, uh, when we do self-selection, we've already chosen the scrum masters and the product owners. So we know who's going into those roles. Um, and we've actually had those guys speed date to work out what who should pair. And they become the anchors of the teams. And when we do self-selection, the team isn't a blank slate. It's a, I don't know, I need a tech lead, three devs, two testers, whatever, right? I, I know the shape of the team. And then people are choosing which team they want to work in, but those teams have to fit whatever those team shapes are. Um, there has to be a whole heap of socialization uh, leading into that self-selection event. Um, so, you know, while it may not be the formal two-day class, uh, would I be talking to people about Agile if they didn't know what that was? Absolutely. Um, would I be talking to them about SAFE if they didn't know what that was? Absolutely. You need to give people context. Um, and I already explained why we like the, the team formation before the, the training. Does that, does that help, Sal? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Nice. I think Avi's got a question, but he's on mute. Uh, sorry, no, I'm off. Hi, Anne, how are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Yes. Quick question, um, Anne. You know, the concept of conflict resolution, and I'm quite sure you went across different organizations implementing um, SAFE. Uh, teams would have different conflicts and have their own emotions and they have their own agenda. What are your strategies, you know, in terms of ironing out the glitches among the teams? Uh, so some of the probably fine print in some of what I was talking about is, is how do you get teams cross pollinating? So the, the unity hour, I think has actually been the, the cornerstone of a lot of what we do, because when we do unity hour, we don't, you don't lead the teams in their teams. It's very deliberate. You're going to run a bunch of exercises, games, whatever it is, and you're going to break people up across different teams. So you're going to create connectivity between each team by people meeting people in other teams. It's actually the same theory that they use in the book um, Team of Teams by General McChrystal. Um, basically, if you know someone in another team, then that creates a connection between your team and, and that team. Um, and as humans, when we know people, we're, we're so much more forgiving than when we don't. So it's also why, um, you know, if we're distributed or, or whatever our challenge is, we have to find ways to spend human time together because we are so much more forgiving of people we know than we are of people who are just a, a faceless, email address, right? It, it just, it's just different. So um, it's really important. So I, I think Unity Hour has always been the, the key for me and making sure that Unity Hour is not used to um, increase competition between teams, but to increase collaboration. So I had a client a number of years ago who came up with a really fun set of games and they, and they called it you know, the little Olympics thing. But instead of having the teams cross pollinate, they had the teams competing against each other, each other in these games. And that's not, that's not going to help, right? You don't want competition between the teams. Uh, you want people working together uh, outside their teams to create those human connections. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's an iterative continuous development process, isn't it? You can't solve it overnight. Um, eventually, uh, through massaging and through consultancy and through coaching, um, you refine it as we move ahead. Okay. Thanks, yeah. Sam. It's definitely not a, an overnight thing. No, no, no worries. I mean, probably again, another bit of the, the fine print. Uh, when I work with an organisation in the beginning and we do something like Unity Hour, um, we, we're really clear with folks, this is, this is mandatory. This is, not, this is not optional fun. This is mandatory fun. Um, so everybody has to come. Everybody has to come and play. Um, and then after a while, it, it's fine. Um, but you probably have to spend maybe the first three months really saying, no, no, we're, we're going to do this. We're going to take an hour out and, and we're going to do this. And there's always some really important dev somewhere who's way too important to come and hang out with everybody else. And, you know, I'll send their scrum master to go and get them and say, get them here. Um, everybody's going to participate. We're all going to get to know each other. Um, 
So you don't have to do that for long. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Okay. Right, so this is Jay. You know, I think we've got to think also from a sociological anthropology point of view that when we work for a company, most of us are hired and we're in the company to do something and we, we get to know people. I mean, it's not like, you know, we met these people at a bar and we're taking them home and having sex with them and leaving, right? This is like a work environment and we're getting them and we're kind of like forced to work with people, right? And we're kind of forced to get yeah. to know them and like them, right? And and and, and you, you have very limited options. One, you're gonna get, you're gonna like them and work together or you're gonna leave or get fired or whatever, right? So that, you know, that's generally, you know, it's, it's kind of like a zero or one, right? So then the question is like, you know, how do we get people over the hump where they can deal with the other persons? To get, and at the same time, get to like them and have fun and get, get to make friends and have, you know, have a psychological safe environment that you're happy to go work with and spend most of your life for some period of time, you know, doing 40, 60, 80 hours working with these people, right? And that's a hard ask if you think about it. It's a hard ask to ask people to do that. And it's gotta be more than a paycheck. You know, Daniel Pink, you know, the purpose mass, you know, all that, you know, all that is, is needed, you know. So I, so some companies I've worked with in the past, the teams hire and fire the people. So when new people yep. come on, it's not HR. HR may get the re you know the resumes in, and the manager may have some you know adjacent responsibility, but the team decides who's going to work with the team because they're the best ones to decide. Of course, you know you, you never know, but you know how many companies actually do that? I, I know very few companies that allow the team. To make those HR responsibilities, Emma, have you ever worked with any companies that do that? Um, I used to do it. Um, so my teams used to take new hires out for coffee or lunch before we bring them on. Um, they'd go through, so we'd know that we'd want to offer them, and then we'd send them to the to the team. And if the team didn't like them, then you know, try again. Um, so yeah, I've I've certainly done it. Um, you know, probably not the purest view, but um, we were very much of the, the view that the, the team had to feel okay about it, had to be part of the process. I worked with a, a really great engineering manager, and one of the things that he does when he is doing one-on-one -on -one coaching um, is if, someone, if someone's having a conflict and they're just complaining about, you know, someone else on their team, he'll stop them and ask them, do you still believe in this person as a team member? Do you still want to be do you still want them on your team? And it, it stops it and, and gets a blunt yes or no answer. And if the person says yes, then you say, okay, how do we work to bring them in more? What, based on what you know, you're, you have a conflict about or you're having an issue about, what's a step that you can try to engage with them or to go about that? And it starts from there and it says, yes, I still believe. And if it's honestly, no, I don't, then you say, well, what can we do for you that's gonna help you find the right place. Um, and that was really powerful. Um, that it, it stops just the, the pure kind of reactivity and stops it and says like, where do you want to go? And what do you want to do with this person? So that's been a really great, I've heard very good things from him using that technique. So M, have you cracked the net where you had persistent, mm. dedicated teams and they stay together for life? Well, you know, not for life, but you know, no one's moving people around at the end of the project or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, so the, um, the so it's persistent teams, absolutely. Um, it, it's interesting how people don't get it actually. Uh, so it's certainly what we teach. It's certainly, uh, I've done it. I've had great success with it some places and, and other places I'm like, hang on, which part of long live teams didn't you guys get when we were, were setting all this up? Um, so I guess, you know, people hear what they want to hear. Um, I think, you know, long live teams are, are kind of, um, even if you want that, it can still be really hard to do because, you know, life happens. 
Um, so, you know, I, I find that you can't always keep everything perfect because, you know, people leave, right? People have babies and get married and move countries and, you know, people do stuff. Um, so that disrupts. Uh, what I like to do when we have a disruption is um, open up the self-selection again and let the team solve the problem as opposed to solving it for them. Um, so do people want to shuffle? Do they just want to backfill? What do we, what do we want to do? Which team are we going to backfill into? Um, funny thing is when you do open up self-selection again, for the most part, people don't change teams. Um, so people also like the stable teams. Uh, so the biggest challenge in that space is if literally people who just don't get it. Seth again with one quick question. Um, I'm trying to help set kind of the the timeline with how you, what you shared with us. Obviously, we know it's not overnight. So what what was the the general timeline with the build up of that train, for in kind of a generalization? I say you'll get um, and probably looking back to some of my earlier comments, Seth. I mean, my world is obviously very jumbled with the with the safe world. Um, but we, we find organisations hit, um, you know, self-managing, self-organising, team of agile teams, nine to 12 months. Um, assuming, you know, a whole raft of stuff in this playbook is actually happening. But it, it's not a slow, you know, is it a slow process? I don't know. I don't think nine to 12 months is a slow process for, for these types of enterprises and these types of things. Um, sorry? I was going to say, I would have called that definitely. That was accelerated. That sounded amazing. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, never, never taken longer than a year that I can, can recall to get to a pretty good place. Um, and then they keep going, right? So what we ideally find with most of these folks is they get a bit of what we call Kaizen mindset and it just keeps going. And, and Am, you probably experienced this too. You know, it's like a team of teams in the in the world. You know, in the enterprise or corporate world. So you know, yeah, the release train and, and the teams that are developing or delivering a solution. But then you have the teams of the lane portfolio management. You have the executive teams. You know, and you have uh, communities of practice horizontally across the organization and their teams, right? And then then you have your customer, which should be part of your team, right? So, so it's, it's, it's like, uh, how do you align all these people and, 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 and have them get along? And it's hard. It's, it's, it's a complex, dynamic, adaptive domain. And, and it's, it, it, mm -hmm. I, in my experience, it, it, every day you go to work, you don't know what problem or challenge you're going to have, but you're going to have one. Yep. Yep, it's um, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's not easy. But but if it, if it was easy, Em, would you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Um, <laughs> I mean, this for me is is a fun right? I mean, uh, and it's it's an interesting one. You know, why why safe? I don't know. Safe is is where I started. It is what I know. Um, and I can do this and I can do this with SAFE and, and it's so much fun to, to take these organisations from whatever world they're in to this place where people like to work, right? Um, it's the, you know, how did I go from, uh, you know, working in, in you know, corporate to, to consulting was, it was just so much fun to be able to change, it, change these environments um, and, and so infectious, right? So one would lead to another, would lead to another because they'd start sharing what, what they were doing. So such a nice thing. I think you know, one of my um, strongest memories of leaving that first site was the last day, you folks saying to me, you know, Em, you changed my life. And I'm like, well, no, I didn't really. We just changed where you worked. But you know, it, it's such a, that people felt that way about it. And, and I've seen that over and over again, that people found this shift in how they work to be life changing. Like, Isn't that cool? Wouldn't it be fun just to change people's lives? Well, for the better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Please, yes. <laughs> uh, any other questions for M? Because uh, probably getting close to lunchtime for her. Um, it is. <laughs> 
So, uh, so uh, Ms. M. Campbell Pretty, thank you very much for your time today. We learned a lot. You're a wonderful person, and we'll stay in contact. Yes, please do. I'll send you through the, the slide decks and yeah, feel free to you know, connect on whatever medium works for you. Yeah, thank you. And I'll send it out to everyone. And uh, so thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna end early at 7.21 p.m. Pacific time. And thank you everyone for joining and, and look forward to the next one. We have another one coming up. So we'll talk to everyone again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.